So greetings to everybody. Um, it's an interesting time in the world right now, of course, and I'm struck, I'm sitting here in San Francisco. It's a beautiful day, a blue sky, there's green trees out there. I'm hearing more birds than usual. And the contrast with the vision of the world right now in terms of the strife that's out there, the pandemic, uh, and much more is just striking to me. So it's actually, I think, especially valuable speaking personally, to be able to talk and hear from some people who are really doing something in their realm that is so positive and, and uh, helpful in the world. So I met uh, Marvin at Endwell, the great big uh, end of life conference that happens every fall here in San Francisco. And he did his discussion of his own story and the work that he's doing. And to me, it was the most powerful talk of that day. And at the same time, there are other people involved in some of the work that he's doing uh, that I knew already or met soon. And so it was a small world thing that uh, Marvin's work and the work of both Sandra Fish and Lady Bid Morgan would then become just recently part of the common wheel family. So it's very rewarding in that, in that aspect. So we decided to schedule this talk and here we are. So what we are going to do, I asked uh, Marvin to do whatever version he felt appropriate of his story, basically uh, that I, that many of us heard at Endwell and then remarks also from Lady Berg and Sandra, and then have open discussion about the issues that, that it raises, which are profound. And uh, you know, both these uh, start off. We would love to hear your story as you see fit to tell it today. Thank you very much for joining us, and please go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, uh, one of the things that is uh, always been a rarity in my life uh, is being able to be heard. Uh, and sometimes that's environmental because I've never had a problem talking and asking to be heard. But uh, sometimes you're in a place that um, takes uh, the audible um, sound of your voice out of reach of people that need to hear it so uh i'm still getting used to being able to say what i want to say and having somebody hear that uh and it's it's gratifying and frightening at the same time um as you know a little more than three a little more than four years ago uh, i was sitting in a prison cell and i was serving out the 41st year of a seven year to life sentence, uh, the result of a wrongful conviction suffered in 1975. And uh, in my mind, I'd long ago reconciled myself with the very real possibility that I may in fact uh, die in chains on the concrete floor of my cell. Um, I'm the second generation of my family that's been imprisoned. Uh, my mother's a Holocaust survivor. And in recent years, uh, Science has confirmed what I have somehow always known, that the effects of her internment are um, indeed intergenerational. Uh, my father was a Baptist minister. Uh, he divorced my mother shortly after my sister was born and I was two years old. And um, pursued by the physical and emotional horrors of her young life, my mother was hospitalized often and both my sister and I were stored in foster care for most of the time. I became a chronic runaway and was soon declared incorrigible. I, uh, I'm, uh, I, I was uh, really stunned when the judge uh, sent me away uh, as a young child uh, and said I was incorrigible. I went back and looked it up. And I could not believe <laughs> that he said that even I at that young age knew that nobody's beyond redemption and uh, to, to call a child incorrigible was shocking, even to my young mind. Um, 
But over the next 12 years, uh, my life spiraled out of the uh, moonless universe that I had known for the whole of my young life. And at 18, I found myself in prison where I would be for the next 41 years. Um, as soon as I was able, I went to the prison law library. I knew it was the law that put me there. And if I could somehow just reverse engineer it, I could free myself. Uh, my first week in the law stacks, I met a library clerk uh, who was a member of the prisoners union. Uh, he gave me some literature and I soon joined the action arm of the Earth prison reform movement. For the next 20 years, I was involved in litigating everything from food and education to community standard health care. Uh, in 2000, uh, an author named Carlton Smith was researching a book about a serial killer on death row. And uh, it was him that discovered the evidence that indicated it was indeed the subject of his book that was responsible for the crime that sent me to prison nearly three decades before. Uh, this eventually led to both the Golden Gate University Innocence Project uh, and ultimately the, the USC Post-Conviction Justice Project taking my case. And for the next 16 years, teams of lawyers, clinical law professors, and their students fought to free me, even as the struggle inside prison walls continued. The ensuing years held critical gains and staggering losses of both the collective and personal nature. February 17, 2005, Started out just like any other day at San Quentin. Uh, my friend Robert Dubbard and I uh, shared a table in the chow hall for breakfast, talked about the politics of the day. And after our meal, I left for my council office and Robert went back to the block to wait for the exercise yard to open. Pretty much the same way we had every day for 17 years. Robert never went to the yard that morning because he returned to his cell and took his own life. I was stunned. I couldn't understand how this person who I loved would have been an hour away from making such a fatal decision. I didn't see it. I needed to know what I'd missed. So I wrote letters and began to search for someone to come inside and teach us what to look for. After several months, I heard from Marsha Blackstock and Diane Banyan from Bay War, a crisis intervention, sexual assault and suicide prevention hotline. They agreed to come into San Quentin and deliver an 18 month curriculum. And ultimately those two remarkable women shepherded myself and 14 of Robert's friends to state certification in crisis intervention, suicide prevention and male sexual assault survivor counseling. With our newly acquired certifications, we created a group of peer intercessors aptly named Brothers Keepers. In 2005, San Quentin had a suicide rate six times the national average and today it's zero due to these peer intercessors. In 2008, in the course of a long and protracted lawsuit against the guards union, I was attacked uh, by white supremacists and thrown from the third tier of North Block. And my injuries were so serious, I ended up in the California Medical Facility, a prison hospital in Vacaville, California. In 2011, midway through my recovery, I received word that a close friend of mine, Wayne Cobb, had been transferred to the hospital, to the uh, prison hospital, and wanted to see me. When I asked uh, which hospital block he was in, I was told he was in hospice. I was confused uh, uh, where I asked his hospice. I was given directions, and eventually I found Wayne in CMF's 17 bed hospice in the bowels of the prison. He was not in good shape. I was astounded. I could hardly believe that there was a place like this inside the walls of California's Department of Corrections. I was startled by the fact that some prisoners would not have to die alone on the concrete floor of their cell. So I learned that those in hospice were cared for almost entirely by fellow prisoners and that they were allowed to have their family visit them at bedside and have them there at the end to sit vigil. If the patient had no family uh, that were able to visit, they were allowed to have their cellmate or their friends uh, visit them daily and ultimately sit vigil with them. Wayne's family were all in Battle Creek, Michigan, so I, I visited him often and knew I was there for him as he shed his earthly chains. Over the next five years, thanks to this remarkable program, I was privileged to sit and comfort the last days of no less than 10 of my close friends. I became a staunch and vocal advocate for the need of, for hospital be, uh, hospice beds in, in, in every prison in California. In 2016, due wholly to the tireless efforts of Heidi Rommel and the USC Post-Conviction Justice Project, Susan Rupperg and the Golden Gate University Innocence Project, Michael Snedeker of Snedeker and Short, and the law firm of Morrison and Forrester, 
I was released from prison. Standing outside the gates I entered through 41 years before, the feeling was familiar. Once again, I felt defenseless, without an ability to recognize a world that, like me, had changed so much. There to meet me was my friend and now wife, Deborah, and a videographer from KQED. Over the next six months, Deborah remained my constant support and introduced me to everything from cell phones to spontaneous adventures. Most remarkably, I found every new thing validated and provided reason for all that had come before. Over my 41 years behind the walls, I came to know that we are, at any given time, right where we're supposed to be on our path. So I'm constantly looking for signs to inform my forward journey, and invariably I find those signs emerge from the darkness that was my past. One such sign for me came the day of my release, February 17th, 2016. February 17th, the exact date Robert took his life. I stood motionless for a moment outside the prison and wondered at the joining of these two dates in time. Several months after my release, I received a call from Sandy Fish, and she told me that she and her associate, Lady Bird Morgan, had been trying to get an audience with the warden uh, for 10 years uh, in the hopes that a hospice could be established at the prison. We followed up that conversation with a lunch, and within weeks, the Humane Prison Hospice Project was born. Today, Sandy Fish and Lady Bird Morgan, along with Mission Hospice and Home Care, and the Shanti Project go into San Quentin to provide uh, compassionate end of life training to our brothers keepers and have graduated two classes of compassionate caregivers. There's still resistance to a physical hospice at San Quentin. We haven't been able to establish uh, a hospice like Vacaville has, but men are still dying in their cells and San Quentin's brothers keepers are there to shine light of compassion on their departing brothers. Nearly 200,000 Americans over 55 are currently imprisoned, and by 2030, the number of elderly prisoners is expected to reach 400,000. Yet in California, there's just 17 beds in a system with 126,000 prisoners. Ending well should not be dependent on living well, nor should it be premised on the living of an exemplary life. The fallen and broken men and women in prison are often there because the start of their young lives showed them the worst of humanity. Certainly at the gates of freedom, we can send them off with at least a glimpse of what's best about humanity, compassion, empathy, love, and redemption, proof that we value the dignity of life, every life, above all else. Uh, when uh, I um, uh, left prison, uh, when I first walked into prison, um, uh, you're blind when you first go to prison. There's this, um, this period of time where you're, where you're groping around trying to find your place uh, in this darkness and, uh, and identify everything that's, that's hidden in the shadows. And um, eventually you become acclimated to the dark. And once I was able to see, uh, I saw that the place was this minefield of broken lives. And, um, they were asking me to take this journey with them and help them fix things. I, um, I've always been an injustice collector my entire life. Uh, from the time I was a child in foster care, um, uh, up through my experiences uh, in juvenile hall and the boys ranch and children prison. Um, yes, there's children prisons. Uh, but uh, I, I always had this desire to fix things that were unfair. And so I, I was able to, to understand that ab abuse will make you one of two things. It will make you an abuser or it will make you, make you a fixer. And I happened to be one of those people that wanted to fix things. And so... Um, the fact that I was an injustice collector actually saved me because once I got acclimated to the dark and I figured out that there was so much brokenness in prison, uh, I, from day one, I was occupied with all of these things that needed to be fixed and all these people that needed help. And had I had time to sit on my bunk and ruminate on the injustice of my wrongful conviction, 
it would have crushed me. I would have probably not um, been able to function under the weight of that realization. So um, it was actually one of the things that helped me get through. Uh, when I left prison, I found that there's a second period of blindness when you leave the dark and come back to the light. It was equally as blinding. I was um, I was unable to um, to navigate without a guide, and and I, I realized that that was part of the the um, part of the um, brokenness of the prison system, the whole um, release and parole process uh, is basically unguided. And uh, people leave prison after decades in a cell uh, and they're standing out in front of a prison and then there's, there's nobody there to help them figure out this world that has um, gone on while even while they were static and behind bars. When I left prison, Richard Nixon was president. And now, uh, I don't know, I might go back to prison. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, um, the world has really changed. And uh, the technology was just um, remarkable and frightening at the same time. Uh, I learned how to use the phone and uh, and uh, found that we are, are a phone-centric society and that um, you can't even talk to a real person at the employment department without getting on the computer first. You, you, if you don't know these things, you're just not going to make it. So um, I uh, became director of advocacy at the Prison Reentry Network, and um, I partnered up with... Um, uh, another organization uh, named Bonafide, uh, a friend of mine, David Cowan, and his wife, Rebecca Carter, created this organization to um, help shepherd people out of the prison system into the, into the community in some legitimate way. So what we do is um, we pick people up at the front gate after decades in prison. We give them a smartphone. We take them to Target. Uh, get them out of their parole clothes, we take them to breakfast, and then we put them on a, a, a train or a bus to whatever city and county they're going to. And we try to hook them up with somebody in that county or city that has already navigated through the shoals and is able to hang with them for six months and help them get their free legs under them. And it's very, very successful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, 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 it came to me that that it's exactly the same uh, whether you're leaving a prison cell and coming out to the community or you're leaving this world, you shouldn't do it alone. There has to be somebody there. And the saddest thing, the most terrifying thing for people in prison is the thought that you may die in prison. I've, I've um, carried that fear uh, Almost the entire time I was in prison, you see death. It's one of the most violent places. It breeds violence, the prison system. And it's, it's almost an inevitability. It's like um, I knew immediately what some of the young people in marginalized communities grow up feeling, uh, that uh, if I make it to 20, I'm going to be lucky. And so uh, every day you're facing your mortality because of the the violence that's, that is um, uh, winding around you like um, a constrictor. It's like, uh, it's, it, it squeezes you until you feel you can't breathe anymore and it becomes normal to, to be without breath. Uh, there's a darkness in there that, that seeps into your pores and gets in your bones and if you don't have a purpose, if you don't keep a lamp lit, you become as dark as the place you're in. I used to have a hobby. Uh, I used to watch in my young life in prison, I used to watch new people come in and even new guards. 
I used to watch them and watch as the prison slowly overtook them. And it's visible. You can see it. You, it, you can almost mark the day that they become dark. And um, it's a sad thing. It really is. And you really can't do anything about it. Um, uh, uh, even now, uh, I, I try to go back in and um, reach into uh, the lives of those I left behind. And uh, I've been back in San Quentin four or five times. Um, the One of the greatest books on social justice, I believe, that was ever written was Plato's Republic. Uh, and the whole time I was in prison, 41 years, I kept a copy of that book. And then when they would take it during you know, self searches and I would end up getting another copy because I, I just loved the book. And um, there's this wonderful passage about uh, these prisoners who are bound from, from uh, foot to head in a cave and they can't turn their head. They can just look at the wall in front of them and behind them, there's this huge flame that people are walking in front of with these cardboard cutouts of these representations of real life things and the prisoners think that those shadows are real they think it's real life and um plato says that every once in a while somebody will get unbound and make it out of the cave and when they discover the true light uh they have a responsibility to go back in to the cave which is dangerous because you're going to go back in and and challenge the belief system of the people you left behind. And you're messing with the people who are casting the shadows, which has a purpose as well for them. So it's very dangerous, but um, it's something that, that that some of us feel obligated to do. Um, and so my life is kind of divided between um, uh, this a uh, social advocate who wants to um, collect the shards of the broken vessel and try and put it back into some whole um, condition. And then um, there's another part of me that recognizes that um, there's some things that we just have to do as human beings uh, and this is this is something that you either you either make uh, personal to yourself or you extend it outwards uh, and model it to other people. Uh, I remember um, one of the turning points for me with hospice was not just seeing Wayne there and 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 being able to be there for him as he left this world. Uh, I, I saw one of the more remarkable things I'd ever seen in prison. Uh, there was a guy who was in prison for killing a state trooper during a traffic stop. He was one of the most hated uh, prisoners by guards in the system. That They hated him. He was in there for years and years. Um, somehow... Um, he was able to get one of these beds in the hospice. Somehow he ended up in one of these 17 hospice beds that are extant in the prison system in California. His, uh, he was brought in and as soon as they heard who he was, uh, the, the rule was you had to have less than six months to live. And when they brought him in, the guard that was working that unit at that time said, if I had my way, he wouldn't have six minutes to live. He hated him. And uh, over the course of the next few months, his family was coming in, his daughter and her husband uh, and a couple other family members, uh, his brother. And um, we were able to watch the, the pure emotion that was... Um, flooding the room when these uh, family members were there knowing that their loved one was going to leave this world and they just wanted to um um coat him and comfort him with this love 
it was very powerful, even for people that did not know the story. It was very powerful. This this person was um, uh, long ago left behind the person that committed the crime. And he was um, truly um, fearful of the fact that he had done such a bad thing that what does this say about what's ahead for him uh, as he leaves this world? And um, on a spiritual level, people tried to comfort him and it, he came to a realization that he was at peace. And um, when he went on vigil, uh, this this had an effect on the entire um, uh, hospice. It, everybody that was there, doctors, nurses, everybody saw this this light of compassion that was beaming out of this room. And uh, when he went on vigil, uh, the last 10 minutes of his life, uh, his family was there uh, and the guard came into the room and took off his hat and he stood against the wall. And he watched uh, as the family said goodbye to him. And uh, after he died, he put his hat back on and he left and he sat quietly in the back of the hospice. That was the most remarkable thing I'd ever seen. It was, um, it was almost unbelievable that this, the compassion that came at the end of this man's life transformed and dispelled even the hate that this guy had lived with the whole of his career. And um, he was not the same after that. He was a different person. And um, I believe that hospice uh, in this very dark and violent place that I've already told you about that hospice was like the soul of the prison. It, it transformed the darkness of that place. It was a beacon for people that needed to find that well of compassion. And um, I don't think that it should be exclusive to Vacaville. I think we should have it in every prison in California and in the United States. If you're going to choose this awful sanction, if you're going to choose to let somebody die in prison, uh, then I would say you have an obligation as a human being and as part of a sentient society to recognize the humanity of this person, even as you exact punishment uh, for some harm that this person has done in his life. Um, I believe that if we had um, not just the opportunity, but the mandate that these individuals that we shackle throughout the entirety of their life until they take their last breath, if we had this mandate to recognize the humanness of this person, it will change us and we will look at things differently. Um, so I, I do say that there is a practical reason why we should have hospice and that it's just the right thing to do. But there's also a revolutionary ideal behind this. I think that if we, if we can find a way to, to lay a hand of comfort and compassion on the brow of those most feared or most despised in this society, that it would, it will bring us, um, closer to mending the the tremendous um, cracks and fissures in our own broken society. Uh, you can only 
I mean, you just have to turn on your TV and watch it for five minutes to understand that things are broken. And um, uh, I think that uh, with 126,000 people in prison currently in California, that um, uh, if you stop and talk to each of these people, you're going to find out that they're fathers and sons and grandfathers and uncles and grandmothers and mothers and sisters and daughters. Um, and uh, as I said today, and, um, and I, I like to tell people that um, when it comes to dying, uh, it should not be premised on the living of an exemplary life. It, it, it's, 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 it has nothing to do with the fact that a, a human being is dying and um, we have an obligation to, to um, help that person uh, cross over in a legitimate way that doesn't cause more harm. Right now, the system is broken. We know it is. Um, uh, that, found, that, that person's family that I told you about they suffered the entire time he was in prison. And I understand the harm. I understand why um, this need for revenge uh, uh, wells up in people. But uh, it shouldn't be just about revenge because that revenge, that emotion is pernicious. It, it, it will consume everything else. And um, in a system that already is self-perpetuating, uh, it eats its young, it creates at one level what it needs for the next. Um, we will continue to um, allow the darkness that's being, um, that, that permeates the prison system to get outside the walls and into our communities and you see the effect of it. So if we wanna, uh, like my friend Brian Stevenson says, if if you want to fix brokenness, you have to be proximal to it. And so um, having our centers of humanity and compassion um, have a place inside the prison systems around the country and the world uh, is a good start to um, understanding that we as a community um, have an obligation to recognize the humanity of everybody, even as we punish them. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's really something that's, uh, uh, it, it, there's a tension in, in myself and in, inside me about how I wanna do things. I know that there's certain things that have to be done in um, a collective uh, human way. And there's other things that um, I, I know that I have to just do on a personal level myself. And if it models that something for somebody else, then that's fine. But I, um, I remember what Brothers Keepers was created. Um, we had these men were, were immediately overwhelmed with how much there was to fix. Uh, these peer intercessors, uh, we found that Robert killed himself and never talked to a psychologist or anybody else in the prison. And they wanted to know why. And I told them because if a prisoner tells somebody that they're having this ideation, if they tell somebody that they're having this depression, it goes into their prison file. And when they go to the parole board, they get denied parole because they have psychological issues. So they just stuff it. And eventually turn it in on themselves, they take their own life. And so um, uh, these guys were overwhelmed. But once we created Brothers Keepers and they found that they could come to their fellows and tell them how they're feeling and, and have somebody hear them, uh, it had a profound effect on the people that were able to, to tell people how they felt. But it also had a profound effect on our brother's keepers and they, they 
they were overwhelmed. So we had to have a talk uh, and told them, look, uh, you can't save the world. You can only strive to save that that's what in front of you, that's, that's within your ambit. And so we um, talked about Lauren Isley's star thrower and the, the guy walking down the beach, he's seen a young man um, standing on the beach among thousands of starfish in the sand and picking them up one at a time and throwing them in the water. He told him, what are you doing? He says, I'm saving starfish. He says, well, there's too many. You'll never make a difference. And he picked one up and threw it in the water and said, I'll make a difference to that one. And that's why we have this starfish pen to let the brothers keepers know that you can only do what you can do one person at a time. And, um, and it worked. I mean, uh, it changed that just that that small band of men, these peer intercessors, uh, changed uh, the the prison environment at San Quentin. And uh, when nine eleven happened, there was there was people all over the prison stunned. I, they they didn't know what was wrong, and uh, it eventually turned out that these men who have been victimizers all their life were feeling victimization for the first time. They, they felt this victimization and we told them to turn around and embrace that and know it, know that there's a few things that cause that make victims out of the entire world. Uh, you know, JFK, Martin Luther King, uh, 9-11, some of these these horrendous events, you know, Vietnam, uh, it, it, these guys um, wanted to do something. Uh, even as they realized that the community they wanted to do it for had rejected them and, sh and, and locked them away behind the walls. So they um, had a fundraiser. They did a walkathon and some other things. Uh, we were able to have uh, prisoners and staff sponsor these guys who were doing the walking uh, and uh, had a food sale. And uh, the prisoners collected $42,000 for victims of 9-11. This is a population of men who probably make 14 cents an hour if they're working in PIA, uh, up to 90 cents an hour if they're a lead man. But um, they had no money, but they wanted to do this. And um, it changed things. It really changed things in that prison. Uh, it's, it's now uh, this place of, of insight and learning. Uh, uh, San Quentin's like a criminal version of Yaddo. It's like, uh, it's, it's amazing what's going on there and the transformations that are happening to people that make it there. Uh, and I think that we can look at the lessons that we learned from these things and try to do something different. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not too sure that, um, uh, in the current climate that we are suffering out here on this side of the wall that, um, uh, we're not going backwards, but even as we realize that um, we're going backwards, there's still things that we can learn by going backwards. And uh, I find that some of the most revealing things that I, some of the most um, uh, gripping insights that I come to are things that emerge from my past that now make sense. So um, I try to keep track of everything that happens to me, good or bad. And um, if it doesn't make sense now, I carry it around with me like a companion. And eventually, someday, uh, inevitably, I'm able to say, oh, well, that's why that happened, this right here. And it's very gratifying to me. And I think at first it started as a defense against the slashing horror of the 
prison system that I was living in, that everything happens for a reason. But I truly believe that. I would truly believe that uh, when I go out and speak, one of the things I say is uh, the worst thing that California ever did was let me see the inside of that place. They never should have done it because I'm in a position to do something about it in my uh, um, advocacy at the Prison Reentry Network. Uh, we do a lot of lobbying and we talk to lawmakers and we try to give them a glimpse at what's going on and, and you know, what, what the costs, the social costs are, if not the financial costs. Last fiscal year, California spent $13 billion running 35 prisons in California. This year, they're on track to spend $20 billion on 35 prisons in California. And if they would just repurpose a piece of that to this side of the gate, if they would just examine what we know to be crime and punishment, um, we could probably do a lot better. Uh, those bets should be for people you're scared of, not people you're mad at. And there's far too many people in prison who are old and disabled and um, mentally ill, drug addicted, um, or still children. You know, uh, we we really have to do something about how we allow children to become part of a system that is is by its operation hurting them into adult prison. Uh, we should not have a um, criminal justice system. Uh, that has a criminal juvenile um, component. Those children should be part of the um, social services arm of our communities. Uh, sh they should have social workers, not probation officers. And uh, we should figure out how to do things differently with them because they are children. And, uh, and cut off the food supply to these prisons that are not totally sucking up all our resources uh, to the detriment of every marginalized person in this country. But um, uh, it's, it's extinguishing our light of humanity as well. And that is something that you're not gonna get back once it's gone, it's gone. So we have to try and find these people that have the pilot light still lit and help them light their torch and carry that out and light these areas of shadow that um, nobody seems to want to look into. And I think once you find that these shadows have been dispelled, you're going to see that it's not so frightening what's in there. It's not so frightening that you need to just allow it to, to grow and become darker. So, uh, I'm, I'm not going to stop rambling, but uh, if there's anything else you guys want to know, just let me know. I think we will, Marvin. I mean, thank you for that. It's uh, Well, I think anybody listening can see why we wanted to have you on here to tell this story. Um, I find it breathtaking in a way where I have to, to sit back and think about so many things you have said. You mentioned uh, being contacted by Sandra Fish. There you are. There you so are. You mentioned that. So she contacted you, and I want to want to know how did that come about? What made you, in your background and your experience right then, want to reach out to him? To Marvin. Um, so. Mar uh, we, Lady Bird and I were working on this to get hospice and prisons, San Quentin in particular. We wanted to form an organization and have uh, inmates involved. We wanted one inmate on our board. So I was connected to David Cowan and his wife, Rebecca Carter, to use David Cowan uh, in the prison. So I met him and his wife at the Trouble Cafe and was talking about it and Rebecca Carter said, wait a minute, you need to meet Marvin Mutt. He just got out of prison. 
And I said, you know, who's Marvin? And David said, oh, yeah, maybe you do need to meet Marvin. He was known as the mayor of San Quentin. So that's how I contacted Marvin. But why, what in your background, what were you doing that wanted you, that made you want to do this work in the first place? I'm digging Got a little it. bit further to, you know, a little Let's further back. How, you came up. how did you get on this path, I guess I might say? So over, I'll try and keep it truncated. Um, over 30 years ago, I was in a play called Getting Out by Marsha Norman. It's a play about getting out of prison. Uh, I played someone in prison and we did amazing research, went to women's prisons and my eyes opened up to our prison system and they never shut. Organically over the years, I got drawn more into what goes on in prisons and did hold my best friend's hand when she took her last breath in 97. I was also working in prisons in New York City and uh, moved back here and had a part-time job in Michael Satris's law office in Bolinas and asked him, how are the prisoners dying in San Quentin? And he said, badly. And you can only imagine to feel after working with ex-inmates who used to tell me in New York, they'd say, I'm going to stay out because I don't want to die in prison. I don't want to die in prison. You know, and so when he said that, I thought, oh, you know, we can't let this happen. That was about 12 years ago, maybe 13 um, as we progressed and when I met with Lady Bird in 2011 or 2012, um, things started moving more quickly and then uh, Marvin came on board even more quickly and we got into San Quentin. I do want to tell one thing that's happened recently for me. Um, and I'm so grateful for these guys, I can't even tell you. It's just something in my bones. You know, it's one of those things where people say, are you still doing that, trying to get hospice in prisons? And I, I say, I drop it like a hot rock. But it's, it's, it just bothers me so much. And recently, um, through the same lawyer, ironically, uh, we have contact with a, an inmate who's on death row who is dying. And we're trying to get to him and um, make precedence for this and to get our brother's keepers involved. It's a long story. I just want to say that part of this story it, that brought a lot of light to me recently is I was given a 110 page psych report on this client. And the attorney said he'd never gotten such a long psych report. It's an amazing psych who did it. She went back generations, each generation more disturbed, violent, uh, um, dysfunctional than the one before until the last 30 pages told about his childhood. It was almost unbearable to read it, knowing that most of the people in prison have grown up under some of this kind of circumstance. I also thought when I found out the man's crime and really something that shouldn't be on the table when you're sitting with someone, but I found out about it and it's pretty dark and I thought, how can I go in there and uh, be light, be caring, non-judgmental? Um, and really it was after reading that those 110 pages that this is the way to break the cycle of pain is to those last breaths are so important as we've witnessed with George Floyd's last breath. I mean, he had no idea his last breath would change the world. And I feel those last breaths of people who have suffered and need some light brought in, it is breaking a cycle of pain and it, and it is, it is profound what what happens at that end. Um, any other questions? I mean, there's so there's so many tales and connections, and uh, I'm just grateful for where we are right now for the work. So it seems to me that you were brought into the end of life work through this 
through Marvin, et cetera. I mean, I know you through the San Francisco End of Life Network. It was something that I co-founded 20 years ago and that you have now been an integral part of putting together. So it, it sounds like you got uh, religion, so or less more to say, to work in this realm through through this very work that we're talking about today. I'd say so, because when I first found out when Michael Satra said they were dying badly, I called San Quentin. My plan was to go in and just sit with people. No, you have to get training. So I went to Hospice by the Bay and I got volunteer training and I volunteered for a couple weeks and the story goes on. But it, it really was the prison work that got me deeper, I'd say. I, 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 that just proves my point. Um, and it will bring us into Lady Bird too because uh, th those walls don't just keep people in, they keep people out. And the one thing that I strove for while I was in the entire time, four decades, I knew that if I could just get the tethers over the wall and hook them to the community and get people to come in and meet these guys, that it would change how they believe about what they're doing inside. Because right now, these faceless um, um, unknowns uh, are, they're being, in some cases, it's tortured, literally tortured. And um, uh, nobody cares because nobody knows. And even if they did know, I think that they have been they have been relegated to um, the garbage heap of society and and nobody cares about garbage, right? Uh, but then when you say nobody cares about garbage, you have to say, well, there's people that actually dig through and separate the recycle from it, you know? And so somebody does care about garbage. And my, my whole thing was to find those people that cared about that and, and to understand that there's a value in these people. And uh, the, uh, when you talk to Lady Bird, you're going to find she was with Doctors Without Borders. It's the same concept. I want to dispel the wall. And she... Uh, lived a life where she did not recognize borders that divided countries and people. So I think it's, it's we were meant to partner up on an endeavor like this. Perfect segue, Lady Bird. Uh, I want to hear, as with both of the previous speakers, your path and how you wound up being involved in this effort too. So you actually have a lot of experience in end of life issues and I think our commonality is through Zen Hospice Project, where you were at as well. So please tell us how you got to here to this point. Um, well, I actually, exactly to Marvin's point, it seems like I was just, it was meant to happen. Um, I came in through uh, Sandy. I was working at Hospice by the Bay at the time, and I was a team leader for managing the social workers and nurses and chaplains and the work that was happening and had gotten accepted to Doctors Without Borders and decided that I needed to do that and have that experience. And the second hat that I've always worn has been in work with sexual violence. And um, over the years of being a hospice caregiver, trainer, and working in sexual violence, I kept noticing this thread, which was that was transformative regardless of the, the role or the, the the reason that the care was being given, there was a transformation that was happening when we turned towards the suffering that was um, facing us. And my last year in Doctors Without Borders in the sexual violence clinic, I, I was struggling with how we weren't addressing the, what we call perpetrators, I hate to use that word, but the, the men and women who were committing the crimes, the sexual crimes, and we were just focusing on the actions of um, taking care of the survivors. I came back very disillusioned, went back into hospice, and again, was feeling a little bit like that was also not really meeting all of the needs. We kept helping people die, but there was this way that the transformation that happens for the individuals providing the care was what I was kind of zeroing in on. What is the transformation that happens when people work in social service and social justice? Every hospice volunteer that I worked with will tell you that they were absolutely transformed by the work. They can't stop doing it once they start opening that door. And as much as I care about how people die and Sandy and Marvin know that I do, my attention is really on holding this container to provide a place for people to experience transformation of their souls, of their beings, the transformation that happens that Marvin spoke to with the guard to, to be able to take his hat off and honor and acknowledge that this was a human being, not an animal that was dying. 
that's what brought me into this work. And so when Sandy and I figured out that we would try it and I realized, oh my God, this is it. This is it. This is people experiencing transformation without it getting shoved down their throat. Like you're in a program for domestic violence or you're in a program to learn about how to be back in the world again. You're providing care. It's, it's as simple and as profound as that. And um, it, it's just, it, it feels absolutely logical. It feels inhumane that it's not happening. The, the benefit to every single person that experiences it is just, um, it's life-changing. It, the medical department, you know, benefits from having that support. So yeah, I feel very strongly that it, to me, it feels like if we can get hospice programs into the 33 prisons in California and then across the nation, it will absolutely transform the, the wounds um, that we experience in this world. It won't be the only thing that's needed, but um, mm -hmm. the transformation I feel like is just um, pretty remarkable. And it's not just the people that are being cared for. Uh, Lady Bird will tell you and Sandy, uh, we, I, I actually, um, one of the things that I did uh, after I was released is uh, I went to Angola to meet the guys that are working the hospice program there. And uh, Edgar Barron, the filmmaker that did uh, Prison Terminal, uh, was able to expound uh, in that great documentary uh, about the transformation in the people that are giving the care. These men uh, and women who are providing hospice care for their fellows inside prison, uh, these prisoners who are giving this care are transformed. Um, prison Terminal talks about a guy who um, uh, was a war hero. I mean, uh, he, um, he ended up in prison and uh, he ended up in hospice in prison and he was a um, segregationist. He did not believe in mixing of the races and he was, this is just how he believed. And the men that took care of him were African-Americans. And um, by the time his death was imminent, they were saying, I love you to each other. And they had a true bond and caring. And um, it transformed not only him, not only Jack, but it transformed the men that were taking care of him. They loved him. And uh, these are people that probably never learned how to love anything. Uh, their young lives were filled with, you know, um, drug addiction and violence and, and marginalization, uh, subjugation. And they never learned how to bond to other humans. And this, these, uh, this hospice program taught them how to care for another human being and attach to them. And a lot of people in prison don't know how to attach to other human beings. They never learned that. And because they've never learned that, they, there's a disconnect from the harm. They, the harm doesn't seem to impact them uh, the way it would somebody who understands just what, what's happening. But the, the hospice program, just the, the, the act of bathing this man and feeding him and combing his hair and, and uh, comforting him in his delusions uh, changed the souls of these people that were taking care of him. And so uh, it's, I believe it's something that we ought to examine. We have to take it apart to the point where how do we infuse this magic into everything that we do in the prison experience to have people come out the other end of that experience, fully actualized human beings with an identity and a capacity for, for um, compassion and empathy. Uh, and if we're not doing that, we're, we're just, we're just, uh, perpetrating more harm. We are doing what is contrary to public safety. If we are not transforming people from prisoner to person, if we're not helping these men self-actualize into some kind of sentient human being on the other end, uh, then we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing for our fellow human beings. These guys already, when you talk to them, I did 41 years. 
And I had a lot of conversations with people about their children they haven't seen and their mother who died and they weren't able to go to the funeral. And every one of these guys weep. Every one of these guys have um, pain. And uh, so I'm not saying that these guys are not already sentient human beings. They just do not know how to activate that interaction with other human beings. Uh, they, all of this stuff it lives within them and is sometimes shielded and guarded because uh, in prison that could be looked at as weakness and uh, somebody will kill you for, for that. And I think we need to, to go into that prison system and start by installing a soul in each of these prisons and allowing um, uh, the, the light of compassion to um, dispel the shadows in their lives, even as they're paying uh, the retribution that society feels is necessary for the harm they've done. Lady Bird, I have a question for you. Uh, you're muted right now, but yeah. So as someone, you have a lot of experience in hospice care and, um, what would you see as if there are, you know, if you can identify as primary differences between the the efforts inside that we're talking about and you know, hospice care outside? I mean, is there particular differences, whether it's organizationally, clinically, but particularly psychologically, that that are striking to you? One of the, the main ones that I noticed is, and I only had very little experience with the groups that I've worked with, um, is that um, they have they have already shed their egos and lost quite a bit. And so their ability to show up so presently for the person that they're caring for is remarkable. Um, I trained a lot of volunteers and, and professional caregivers and you know, when you're outside and you're doing it because you have time and you feel like you're just a really good person and you watched your grandmother die and you want to be helpful in the world, it's a very different quality than I've hurt other people. I can't hide from it. I, I know who I am on the planet and I'm willing to care for this man who I actually maybe didn't even really like that much, but he's dying and I'm going to offer him care and the ability to physically provide care to hold hands to listen deeply they're not distracted with cell phones and um, agendas and that it was it's it's unique even in the just the circles that I sit in with them where they're able to to show up um, with a lot of humility and for somebody who's dying I can only imagine that that feels quite remarkably unique um, my experience even at Zen hospice project which had tremendously beautiful caregiving model and programs and a lot of amazing work happened. There was a lot of focus on the caregivers sometimes around um, how they were cultivating themselves and what that meant. And what I see in, inside is that it's more like a family. Um, it's like you, what you would do for your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. Um, so it's a long answer, but and then just technically, there's obviously challenges with the medications yeah, and their personalities. And most prison medical staff are not trained for in hospice and palliative care, nor is that their intention of going into working in prison. So understandably, there's a learning curve and the need to provide really good support and education for them to, to kind of meet those challenges. Well, you know, we're also been talking, talking just about men. So, I, I, you know, there are women inside as well and uh, i'm wondering if this effort has also been focused there is there there are women's prisons that have hospice programs i don't know how many i know there's what there's one on the east coast i can i wish i had the name i'm sorry i should have had that edgar barons is actually on the call if he wants to type it into the chat edgar the, um, the name of the women's prison that has um, hospice programs but yeah there are and, and even in San Quentin, there are there's a transgender population, and it's not just men inside San Quentin now. Let me ask. I mean, this is maybe a dumb question, but I, um, in the men's prisons that you're familiar with, I mean, even the staffing there are there. Is it all male staffing? Yeah. No, female and male. Yeah, right. nurses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Nurses, doctors are male and female always. Right. Yeah. And and this, the the tension that you alluded to in the beginning of this question, uh, when you're in an, when you're in a prison environment, despotism needs a common enemy, and 
anytime you want to do anything, you want to keep slaves and uh, beat them, you have to convince the people around what you're doing that they're savages and they don't, they're not human. And so you can do that when you wanted to take the Indians and take their land and you, you did the same thing. When you wanted to drop a nuclear bomb on somebody, you, you, you said, yeah, these people are, you know, you do caricatures of them, put them on posters and then the people that would object to, to what you're doing to another human being, uh, all of a sudden don't have an objection because you're not doing this to humans. You've dehumanized these people. And so the problem inside a prison system is that you have thousands of prisoners and you have small bands of guards that control thousands of people. And that's because most of them have bought into the subjugation. Most of these guys believe that this is the way it's supposed to be in their life. And um, the people that work there have to view, even when volunteers come in, uh, a big part of the training is don't believe anything that inmates say. Do not get in conversations with them because they will try and trick you. And so most people that are coming in as volunteers start off being very wary of the people that they're volunteering uh, with uh, or, or for. And, um, and uh, uh, when you bring in a program like this, uh, it requires um, a recognition of humanity. It, re it requires that you recognize that they're human beings and that they, they are entitled to comfort in their last moments in life. And that is totally opposite of what's necessary to keep um, this um, black box, so to speak. Like I said, those walls don't just keep people in, they keep people out. And things go on in prisons across the country that are unspeakable. Just like in Abu Ghraib, when the pictures came out of that prison of people being made to stand on boxes with hoods on their head and electric wires uh, attached to them and, and dogs biting them. And uh, these were young, these were young 19, 20, 21 year old Marines uh, and other and military people that came to work at this place. And within months, they were torturing prisoners. And what is the environment that causes that in young people that had no history of that? So, uh, it's the, the 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 prison itself like i said will take over individuals and uh it, it, it's always dangerous for the people who profit off of that type of thing to allow people in there to start telling other people these are human beings and it's like oh no they're not pay no attention to the man behind the curtain it's, they're not human beings so um it, it's difficult uh each prison is a fiefdom and each warden is the king of that fiefdom. So um, uh, you, it all depends on where you're at, how things run. San Quentin has um, a long and storied history, but uh, I believe that we are, um, uh, for many years now, have come. I noticed one of the comments said, what did you say, a prisoner version of what? And I, I said, Yato. Uh, and... Um, uh, there was a time during the early 60s, late 60s, uh, where prisoners were writing manuscripts and books and reading copious volumes. And uh, they, it, San Quentin was like the epicenter of this literature coming out of the prison system. There were so many manuscripts coming out that the Department of Corrections was charging prisoners an agent's fee for every manuscript that went out. Uh, it was crazy, you know, talking about co-opting. But uh, it was amazing. And today, it's, it's that, again, we have people there uh, dealing with empathy and, um, and enlightenment and introspection. Uh, at one of the most notorious prisons in the state uh, at one time. Uh, and it's, it's due wholly to the changing of a mindset that allow people to come in and recognize that there's human beings in there. And that, that everything that's being done in the prison system is being done in your name. You pay to operate that prison and you pay the salary of everybody that works there. And so 
it's incumbent on you to ask where your return on your correctional investment is. Uh, I'm, I mean, you spent $13 billion last year and 67% to 71% of the people that they let out come back to prison. Then, I mean, if you took your car to a garage and 71% of the cars that they worked on didn't run after they they, they worked on them, they would close. So I'm not understanding uh, why people are not asking where the return on their correctional investment is. We should be providing some societal well with what we do. I mean, I'm not here to start an argument about crime and punishment and what we have to do when somebody's hurting other people. Uh, that's that's a whole nother discussion. But um, but if as a society, we need to ask that question. Uh, what, if what we're doing is making things worse, if what we're doing is causing more harm, anytime you have a system that creates more victims than you started with, it's broken. So I'm, I'm just saying. Well, you, you mentioned the writings, so there was a question I was gonna ask you. Have you begun or are you going to write a book? I've been pecking at it. Uh, actually, I've been um, running from it. I, I started it uh, right after I got out and uh, I've been so busy with so many things uh, that I do um, uh, that I've always been able to excuse myself from it. But since this COVID um, uh, stay at home order, it's been accusing me from my computer. When I turn it on, it's like, there's the file, you know? And so, but there was a book written already uh, that uh, they've made a screenplay out of. They're looking to make a feature length movie out of it. And uh, um, there's been a documentary done by uh, PBS and KQED won a, an Emmy for the documentary they did on my release and my time in prison. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm 63 years old. I went to prison. I, I turned, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, 30, 40, 50, 59 years old in prison. And uh, so now I'm 63. I've been out four years. And uh, um, there's a lot of things that I should do. But um, I left a lot of guys in there that uh, I love. I love them. And uh, uh Every day when I wake up, I I am driven to do something to affect that condition uh, inside and um, try and realize the same freedoms that I'm enjoying right now for those inside. You know, I, I, I I'm still um, barely emerging from um, the large shadow that was the prison. Uh, and one of the things that helped me, you know, when you're in San Quentin the only visible structure from the yard in San Quentin is Mount Tamalpais. When you are on the yard in San Quentin, it's there like this symbol of ascension and freedom. It's just a constant presence in your life. And most lifers like myself, when they get out, almost to the, to the, to the one, will journey there. And I did, I was out two weeks, I went there and climbed up to the top and uh, look down at the prison and uh, it helps you it helps you um, shift from this thing that was that had consumed your entire awareness and your and 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 constituted your entire life uh, it helps you shift it to another place uh, you look at it it's not so significant from up there and it helps you psychologically to say, okay, this isn't, this is going, this is fading into the, into the past. Never really though, it doesn't shift into the past, but um, I mean, you can't live in those cages for 41 years and not always know that um, it uh, is a profound part of, of who you are. So, um, and I don't know that I want to divorce myself from it anyway. Uh, I, I feel guilty and ashamed a lot of times uh, when I am uh, doing something that I know that I couldn't do inside because there's guys in there that can't do it. And so um, 
uh, yeah, I, I don't know all of the answers when it comes to talking about crime and punishment, but I do know that, um, that what we're doing is not contributing to a societal well. What we're doing, this experiment uh, that started with the, you know, um, solitary penitentiaries back east, it's not working. And so we have to figure out, even as we separate somebody who's doing great harm for a time, what do we do with that person once we have them there? Uh, and how do we, how do we figure out how he got that? You know, eh, the night stalker was crawling in windows and killing whole families. This is a young man. He wasn't born that way. I, for one, would have liked to seen somebody find out how did this happen? And so we could recognize it down the road but when we see it in some other young person coming down in, uh, the, 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 their path and taking over their future. We don't do that. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer was doing horrendous things. Of course, we have to stop this harm that he was doing. But even as we incapacitate a person who's doing great harm, we have to figure out how did you, how did this person come to this place in his life? And if we don't know that, it's going to happen again and again. So at, at the very least, we should be finding out what torments this person's life to the point where this happens. And if we're not doing that, then we are letting society down. We are causing a harm to public safety. And so it's not just about warehousing people. It can't just be about revenge. It has to be about figuring out what happened in our society that caused this young life to do this. Uh, and uh, right now we have no answers. So um, I, I think each of us uh, involved in placing our individual uh, tiles to the mosaic will have a piece in, in putting the mosaic together and someday we can all step back and see the picture and figure it out. But um, right now I just got a pocket full of tiles that I'm trying to find a place for. And um, I'll step back and look at the picture when the time comes. But um, yeah. One thing that was striking to me in your story once you were inside is that you wound up uh, in the healthcare inside yourself because of it, as you put it, an attack by white supremacists. Mm -hmm. right? So a little bit of irony there in some ways, uh, you appear to be white to me uh, on the yeah. one hand. And I had a family member who was, in, I had a family member who was in prison for a while too and had great conflicts with them as well. So that, Ironic, and you know, and, and now we're having this big societal problem with you know white supremacy at the highest levels and trickling down, etc. But that triggered, it seemed, your path into this this realm too. Yeah, with some irony there. Right. Yeah. This this part, the hospice part. Look, I had been in prison three decades by that time, and sadly, even I, as much as I was aware of the corruption of the system and, and how I, you know, I joined the prisoners union in 1975 and I was an activist and an organizer for two or three years. And the, the organization imploded over some infighting in the Bay area. So I took the platform for the prisoners union and created an organization on the inside. And we started advocating for prison reform and humane treatment from the inside out. And at the height of its population, our organization inside represented the collective grievances of 174,000 prisoners. Uh, we litigated everything from healthcare to food and education, all of that. And so I was very aware of what was the needs of the system were, but even I thought that we were supposed to die in our cell. Even I thought that we were supposed to die chained to a hospital bed, uh, handcuffed, 
uh, our last breath taken in chains. Uh, it wasn't until I was attacked by white supremacists and went to, to Vacaville that I realized that you didn't have to die that way. You know, the way it stands now in most prisons, guys, when they die in their cell, um, even though the prison knows that they're terminally ill, when you die in your cell, your cellmate goes to segregation, goes to all of his properties taken. He's, he's rolled up, as they call it, taken to the hole, taken to um, solitary confinement. And uh, he stays there until after the autopsy to determine whether this person actually died from whatever it was he was suffering or you killed him. That's just the way it is. And so these guys, some of these guys had been with their cellmates for decades. Now must start their grieving in solitary confinement. Uh, if they even know how to grieve. And so um, uh, when... Uh, and by the way, I'm the reason I did so badly with the white supremacists because um, uh, I never did well with I never did well with um, extremists. Uh, I'm Jewish. That was another strike against me. Uh, so, but I was always the one that told guys, you don't have to listen to them. They don't run anything here, and that was very dangerous for me. It, it, it turned out that um, uh, at the point that I was attacked, I was suing the guard union over some egregious things that had happened. And um, they blogged online, the guards, uh, on a social media site that they were maintaining. Uh, why don't we just have the skinheads take this guy out? And within uh, a week or so of that blog, I was attacked. So they actually uh, uh, recruited some of these these young thugs to to try and kill me. And, um, but, uh, uh, I never did well with, um, people who, uh, hurt other people. I, I told you that the abuse that I suffered in foster care and other places caused me to be a justice, an injustice collector and, and unfairness propelled me right into the face of whatever it was that was causing the unfairness. And in that case, it happened to be the guards and the, and the skinheads that were plaguing the prison block at that time. And uh, I ended up uh, being severely injured. And, um, but uh, that just goes to my point that everything happens for a reason because it wasn't until I got to Vacaville and somebody said that Wayne was in the prison and wanted to see me. I said, where was he? And they said, well, he's in hospice. And, well, where's hospice at? And I went and found this 17-bed hospice that had been operating for 20-plus years deep in the bowels of the prison. It was just the best-kept secret in the entire prison system. And um, uh, I couldn't believe it. I just was shocked and astounded that this, this environment existed and that um, people's family could come and sit at their bedside, that that their cellmate or their friend could be there uh, uh, and, and um, comfort their last minutes. It was unheard of. Uh, and, and even I believe that, that that was not how we were supposed to die, right? So once I found out that this was possible, it was just another thing that, that I, I became very passionate about that uh, uh, if I know that this is something that doesn't have to happen, then why are we doing it? If if all it takes a sick person in prison who has cancer or whatever he has already has a doctor at the prison, already has nurses that give him shots and all of that, gives him his medication. The only thing left to do is to put a sign on a on the outside of a ward that says hospice. And allow some trained prisoners to go in there and take care of these guys and be there with them when they die. Uh, it's not like we're asking you to spend more money. Actually, you would save money. When you transfer a person who's lucky enough to get one of those 17 beds at that hospice, it costs ten dollars to $20,000 to transfer that person. They have to have um, vans and chase cars and sergeants and, and classification committees and 
all sorts of things are involved in moving a person from one prison to another. Prisoners don't want to move from their home. This is a place that they've lived. The people there are their family. They have um, cellmates and friends that they love. And if they're going to die, they would much rather die among these people that they know in the familiar places that they know, even if it is their prison. And so uh, what does it cost us to give these men and women this little bit of humanness at the end of their life? I can tell you what it costs us as human beings to not do it. And uh, uh, the effects of the prison system that I watch take over people will end up taking over whole communities. Because if we're apathetic to the suffering of those um, dying inside the prisons that we support, we are part and parcel of that. And as we divorce ourselves from that, uh, we are also shedding pieces of our own humanity. And uh, I think it's very important that, that we understand the pernicious nature of that type of activity. Even if you don't know what's happening, it is. And uh, that's. So we have actually, this has gone very fast for me. And then there's so many questions and issues I have. We have some on the chat. It seemed, it's, seems to me a lot of this is about forgiveness at some level. And that, you know, both of people of themselves and inside and outside. And I've just, I've always been not mystified, but dismayed to see that decades later, et cetera, after a crime that our society and individuals and families of victims, et cetera, have been unable to, to arrive at any sort of forgiveness and have advocated for the harshest kind of penalties that we have instituted as, as this entire culture has become so prison focused and prison focused. And so, you know, it's another conversation and maybe we can, we can get into that on a different time, but, um, uh, Lady Bird and, and Sandy, do you want to say something else here based on everything we've heard or haven't gotten to yet? Well, I think just to your point, Steve, about forgiveness and, um, you know, we, we are a culture of compartmentalizing things. And so we decide where we can be compassionate, where we can be forgiving, who we turn our attention towards. And it seems like with a lot of the evolution that's been happening, we're finally realizing, oh, we turn towards everything, not just the things that make us feel good or the things that we're comfortable with. And that might have been taught or people thinking about it at weekend retreats, but to actually turn towards everything um, requires a lot of courage, and it seems like we're getting closer to that. Um, so to that question, I feel like, yeah, this is, a, this is a step towards turning towards more of what we have not been turning towards. Andy. And I do still have to say that in my bones, we, we really are connected as human beings, walls or not. And we do feel each other's pain and suffering. And it's just clear to me that the last breaths are so important. And if we ignore any of them, uh, we'll all suffer. Uh, I do want to say that sometimes people on the outside of prison say, why, you know, we don't have enough people out here helping us with people outside of prison. And, and I want to say, you're free to help each other. You can help each other. You are free to go to your neighbors and help your, your family members at the end of their life. These people in prison are, aren't allowed to. And that has to change. And, and it is a profound um, difference it'll make. And that's just a strong feeling. So I appreciate this time to, to have people listen. Absolutely. Thank you. And Marvin, you have any a word in closing for us? Yes, yes I, I am. I am. Uh, I just want to take this last opportunity to thank uh, Commonweal for um, for taking us into their family and uh, and uh, providing the the um, forum for us to have our voice heard. Like I said, uh, it's not something I'm used to. Uh, I'm finding more and more places to have my voice heard. Uh, but 
uh, by far um, is most rewarding for me when I'm when I'm speaking from um, within a family of people that I know are um, focused on uh, repairing the brokenness that we um, we all suffer uh, in our world. Uh, uh, it uh, I'm not a really um, big spiritual person, but I do subscribe to the um, whole Tikkun Alam thing uh, to repair the world. And um, uh, I've always had this curse that I'm able to see broken things. And the other part of that is that I want to fix them. And most of the time, when I was a kid, I couldn't. There's certain people that nobody hears, children, women, prisoners, old people. They don't hear them. Women, not so much anymore. I think they're, they pretty much kick the door in and they, they're going to be heard. But uh, children and all people, prisoners, uh, they, they're not heard. And so um, I want to give voice to at least two, well, I guess three. I'm getting up to that third group. Uh, give voice to all three of those that are left. Uh, I can talk about uh, the things that I needed to say as a child that nobody heard, that children are saying today and nobody's hearing. And the same for prisoners and the same for old people. And it's really sad when you go to prison as a child and you're a prisoner and you're still there as an old person. It's really, really an astounding thing that we do. So, yeah, uh, let's continue this conversation. But I did want to uh, thank Commonweal for, for hearing us and, and inviting us into your home. Well, no, I want to thank you, all three of you, actually. I mean, it's extraordinary work, and it's inspiring. And actually, I, I feel honored to even even know you and be able to, to help host this. So we will conclude with that. Thank you all. Good day. Bye.